the book of Mark this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to the New Testament, to the Gospels. The first book in the New Testament is Matthew, and the second book is Mark. We've been doing kind of a gospel overview. We spent about four weeks on Matthew, now spending just a few weeks on the book of Mark. We'll be there this week in a, maybe a couple more weeks, and then we'll go to Luke and John. The Gospels, all of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, contain the elements of Jesus Christ. Uh, two of them have his birth and the elements surrounding that, and other ones have his ministry. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of all work together. They often tell some of the same accounts. You'll find some of the same parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You'll find some of the same stories and the, the same miracles in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John. John is all over here by himself. We get there, we'll see that John is doing his own thing in the Gospels. But what makes a Gospel a Gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of those books of the Bible, all four of those Gospels, they have that wonderful, fabulous account of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, being buried, and rising again the third day. That is the Gospel, or the good news. And Paul says this in Corinthians. He said, I delivered the Gospel unto you. He said that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When Jesus Christ came to earth, he did a whole bunch of good things. He healed. He resurrected people. He solved problems. He fed people. All these good In fact, the book of Acts says that he went about doing good. But he did not come to earth just to do good things. He came to earth to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that whoever believes in Jesus Christ believes that he is God, believes that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, for the sins of mankind, and rose again the third day. And when he did that, whoever believes in Jesus can have everlasting life. This morning, we're going to look at an account inside of Mark chapter number 6. And it's partway through Jesus Christ's ministry. He's been doing some fabulous things. If you were here the first week when we opened up to the book of Mark, you'll remember that I told you that Mark is different than Matthew and Luke in a couple of key ways. First of all, Mark is like a machine gun. When you come to Matthew, he's pretty methodical. And Luke, Luke is a physician. The Bible tells Luke is a physician. And Luke will tell us things that no other gospel tells us. Luke goes into great detail. Luke will explain things and explain things and explain things, but not Mark. Mark's like, boom, in your face, get it. And then he's on to the next point. And if you miss it the first time, Mark does not circle back around. He just keeps on going and going and going. So Mark chapter 6, about halfway, a little less than halfway through the book, 16 chapters in Mark. We already have found out that, I mean, in the first chapter of Mark, that it came, Jesus Christ came to serve. And man, he, was, he, he came and then he was baptized and authenticated by God and his voice from heaven. There was temptation. He began to heal and boom, he's moving on. But in Mark chapter 6, we come to kind of the middle, somewhere in the middle toward the end of Christ's ministry. We're going to find a couple of phrases in Mark chapter 6 that are not found in any other gospel. Not in Matthew, not in Luke, and not in John. We're going to find out that after this point that there's something that Jesus stopped doing after this point. But something happens in Mark chapter 6 that I believe is incredibly, incredibly revealing to the ministry of those who knew Jesus Christ. I'm entitled the message, What's in the Way? Often, we will let small issues hinder us from believing in Jesus Christ. Sometimes it is for salvation. There are some people that have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ because of some issue. Perhaps it was an experience they had at church. And I feel badly for that. I wish every experience at church was a good experience, but quite frankly, it's not, is it? Even at First Baptist Church, and I love this church. I'm honored and humbled to be a part of this church, but not every experience at First Baptist Church is going to be a positive experience because your pastor is not a perfect man. This church is filled with imperfect people. And sometimes the imperfections hinder us from believing in Jesus. Sometimes, though, people have already put their faith in Jesus, but they don't continue to trust him for daily provision and daily support and help because of some perceived letdown from Jesus Christ. 
small issues that can give us an excuse for not following and getting help from Jesus Christ. Sometimes they don't like the attitude of someone who's talking to them. Sometimes they, people think, well, the preacher, he's too loud or too soft or too hard or too stiff or too overbearing or jokes too much. He's too formal or too informal. Sometimes people are just offended at the smallest things. Sometimes it comes down to a color. Churches have split over the color of paint on the wall. I'm not making this up. I mean, churches, I mean, they get, I mean, factions. Now, thankfully, we've not had this trouble at First Baptist Church. I don't want to put a thought in your head. You may like the color, you may not like the color, but quite frankly, there are bigger things in life than the color on the wall. Can I get an amen from everybody? It doesn't matter, and we'll change it next week. Listen, I grew up painting. My dad painted on the side, and I, I grew up painting since the fourth grade. I'm happy to paint things. In fact, I was happy to paint this ceiling. You're going to look up at it now. I painted the ceiling years ago. Someone asked, Pastor, why are you painting the ceiling? I could. We sprayed this thing with a paint called, but who cares about the color? But my goodness, people get offended for the smallest things. And in Mark chapter 6, we're going to find out that people got offended at Jesus Christ. And because they got offended, they were hindered. Let's look in Mark chapter 6, please, beginning in verse number 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. Talking about Jesus Christ now, he went back to his own country. He went back to his hometown. He went back to his family. He went back to his village. He went back to a place he'd grown up. He went to a place called home. He went back to his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished. They were shocked. They were surprised. They were astounded. They were dumbfounded, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? I'm going to pause there for a moment here. Understand that at this point, Jesus Christ has gone back home. He went to the synagogue in his village where he grew up there in Nazareth. And these people, after hearing Jesus Christ speak and knowing about Jesus Christ, they make these two statements. How does this man know this much wisdom? Man, what he is saying is powerful. It's moving. It's captivating. It's getting me right here. You ever heard things like that? Sometimes in life, we hear just wisdom and, and someone will tell you something like, boy, that's what I needed today. Often from the Bible, God gives us that wisdom. You're like, oh my goodness, boy, that just made everything work out well. And here, these people say, listen, we hear what Jesus is saying, and it gets me right here. And then they knew what Jesus Christ was able to do. They said this, what about these works wrought by his hands, these great works? Now, this is important to understand that they heard Jesus, they understood what he's saying was powerful, and they knew that he could do amazing things. This wasn't his first day in the ministry. He had already performed miracles. He'd done countless works, and they knew about it. Now let's look here in verse number three. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph and Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. They're offended at Jesus Christ. Now, the word offended is a little different than how we use the word offended. When we use the word offended now, it's normally because someone has violated our, our sense of pride. I can't believe how that person treated me. They cut, they cut me in line, and they're offended. I can't believe what that person said to me. And we're offended by what someone says or, or what someone has done to us. This word here has a much deeper meaning. When it says they're offended at him, it means that they were supremely displeased with him or had no respect for him. My friends, I want to challenge us this morning in the thought, what happens when we disregard Jesus Christ? 
What happens when we disregard Jesus Christ? We'll go to the Lord in prayer, open up this passage to see if God has some truth for us today. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the time that we have. And Lord, I pray the next few moments that you would help us. Lord, that you would uh, touch us through your scripture. Lord, that you would reveal areas in our life that we need your help. And Lord, I pray you'd help us today. Lord, if there's someone here who's never trusted you as their Savior, I pray that today that they would put their faith in you. Lord, those who are struggling and needing your help, that they would remove any barriers that would be in the way. Nothing would stop them from their from simple faith in you. Lord, we love you and we trust you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. See, I would, I would submit that the greatest way, the greatest way to determine what you believe about Jesus is to see and consider your response toward Jesus. The greatest way to see how you believe in Jesus is to consider what your response to Jesus is. There are as many responses as there are people in this room. Some respond to Jesus in, in adoration and faith and others in rejection. Some in confusion. Some in indignation. Some in offense. Some in perceived hurt. But here in this passage, we have some people who responded to Jesus Christ and hindered Jesus Christ, what he could do in their life. I want to notice some points about this passage and then give us some help as we get to the end of the message here. Number one, I want you to notice this, that Jesus when to help those who knew him best. All right, we understand that in this passage, Jesus Christ went home. He went home. He went where he grew up. It's where he would have had memories and experiences. Now, I did not grow up here at First Baptist Church. And there's a part of me that's supremely thankful for that, that no lady in this church changed my diapers. I'm thankful for that, that none of you babysat me when I was eight and nine years old. All the stories that you would have. You see, I can paint my own picture now. I can tell you what a good child I was. Don't ask my parents. Please don't ask my parents. You know, they, they probably can't remember accurately, I'm sure. I'm sure my memory is spot on and theirs is slightly jaded, I'm sure. But, but I'm thankful I didn't grow up here. Not that I wouldn't have loved to be in this great church But that you didn't know me through those phases of growing up. But these people knew Jesus Christ. He grew up here. But remember this. Jesus Christ never made a mistake. If you were to look at my past, you would no doubt see some things that you'd be like, oh boy, I knew it. I knew it. You may find this hard to believe, but uh, sometimes in school I got in trouble for talking too much. Fancy that. Fancy that, you know, just, I know it shocks you when you hear that. But Jesus Christ, boy, never a wrong word, one, never a wrong word, never a wrong attitude. It may shock you to believe that there are times in my life that I have and have had a bad attitude. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that would have that acknowledgement. Right? And if I had grown up here, there's no doubt that you'd be like, I remember when he was 15. What a punk. Thankfully, most of you didn't know me at 15. But see, these people knew Jesus Christ at 15. They knew him at 13. But they didn't have anything to pull from where they could say, well, I remember when Jesus Christ threw a rock through the window. They didn't have that experience. He was perfect. Can you imagine having a perfect friend? Can you imagine that? Two people at the synagogue are getting in trouble. Who was talking? Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Who threw the chalk of the teacher? Oh, it was Jesus. I'm sure it was. No, it wasn't Jesus. He's perfect. So these people, though he went home, though they knew him best, they had no negative experiences. Nothing they could draw on. Nothing they could even fabricate. He's perfect. And he goes back home, and I wonder in his human side, Jesus Christ. 100% God, 100% human. I wonder if in his human side, he was excited to go back home, to see the mother Mary, to see his his siblings, his half-siblings, experiences with them, excited to go back home, excited maybe to do some wonderful works. But understand and notice this, that instead of receiving Jesus Christ, they refused him. Instead of receiving him, they refused him. They asked these questions. Look in the scripture. They asked, uh, first of all, uh, 
Whence does this guy get these things? And how can these mighty works be done by his hands? And then look in verse number three. They said, is not this the carpenter? Now this is the only gospel that tells us this. Another gospel will say that, is he not the son of a carpenter? But this tells us that Jesus Christ, as he was growing up as the earthly son of Joseph, Joseph was a carpenter, that Jesus Christ did some woodworking. What these people were saying is like, hey, is not this the guy who put my cabinets in my house? Is not this, is this, this the guy who, who fixed my front door? Is not this the guy who built the rocking chair for my kids? Is not this the carpenter? We know this guy. We, we've seen him do these things. And instead of receiving him, they refused him. They asked in this passage six questions, but they were not looking for answers. They were making accusations. They refused him instead of, refi- of receiving him. And they rejected him instead of respecting him. The Bible says they were offended. They called him the son of Mary. They called him a sibling. All these things were true. He was the son of Mary. He was the half-brother to, to these other people here. And, and he was a carpenter. But falling so short of the significance of Jesus Christ. They say familiarity breeds contempt. They say that when you know somebody well, that there's no respect for them. They say that when you see someone's faults and and errors, that you very well stop respecting them because you've seen their bad qualities. My friends, here in this passage, their familiarity with Jesus Christ bred contempt. They were so familiar with him that they could not receive him. And I want you to notice here in this passage what happened, what happened because of it. I want you to notice what happened because they were so familiar with Jesus Christ. Because, my friends, I'm afraid that we get too familiar with Jesus Christ. This is where I'm going this morning. Just so you know, I'm going to give you the the last, where we're going this morning. That we get so familiar with Jesus Christ that we take him for granted. We become comfortable. We've seen him work before. We've seen his cabinet work, if I can. I want you to notice in the scripture what happened because of it. Remember that Jesus Christ has been in the ministry already. He has done great works by their own admission. Instead of receiving, they rejected. Look here in verse number four. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Jesus says, I don't don't have any respect here. Not in my own country. Not in my own house, not among my family. In verse number five, and he could there do no mighty work. He could do no mighty work. There was no huge miracle done in Jesus' hometown. There was no massive event taking place in Jesus' home city, in his house, with his neighbors, with his family, with his friends. You see, Jesus Christ went to those who should have known him best, but he only helped those he could help. The Bible says that he could do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. You see, Jesus didn't fight for recognition. You know what we often do when When someone doesn't respect us, we try to show them why they should respect us. Let me tell you, let me tell you why I'm important. And let me tell you why you should think I'm important. That's what we do. That's our flesh. Let me tell you why I'm the best at this or why you should not cut me in line and and, and all these things. Jesus didn't fight for recognition. Jesus didn't demand respect. He didn't demand to be known or demand to be listened to. He merely helped those that he could help. And he laid his hands on a few sick people and then walked away and left. I want to challenge us in just the next few moments with this thought that Jesus was hindered. Jesus was hindered from helping. The Bible says he marveled at their unbelief and went around about the villages teaching. We find out after this this passage that Jesus Christ 
did not enter into any more synagogues and taught. He did not teach in any more synagogues. The synagogue was a place of the religious uh, gathering. And here Jesus Christ went there and taught at a place that people who wanted to know about God would go. That's where Jesus went. And it was there, at that synagogue, in his hometown, a place where people gathered to learn about God, that they said, no, we don't want to hear it from Jesus Christ. After this point, Jesus Christ did not go to the synagogues any longer. He went to the villages. He went to places that people would listen to him. It was like if Jesus Christ came to church where we claimed to want to know about Jesus and we mocked him and rejected him and refused him. Jesus, in essence, saying at that point, fine, I won't go to any more churches. I'll just go out walking down the street. This is what happened. Jesus Christ was hindered. His message was hindered. It's not that Jesus wouldn't do a mighty work. It's that he couldn't do a mighty work. They wouldn't allow him to do a mighty work. They didn't want him to heal people or to, or to, or to do these amazing things throughout the miracles of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ points to the faith of the person as being the catalyst for the miracle. He says, thy faith hath made thee whole. Thy faith hath brought thy eyesight. So Jesus Christ did it, but he said, listen, you believe in me and the miracle is effective. And in our life, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And if we don't exercise that faith, we won't see Christ work. And often, we allow our faith to be hindered because we're too familiar with Jesus Christ. We become so familiar, we begin to disregard Jesus Christ. They said in this passage, well, well, he's a cabinet maker. For years, Pastor Lett was here, and, and uh, 44 years he served as pastor before I transitioned as, as the, the lead pastor here. Pastor was a, is, a, is a tremendous speaker, tremendous orator. Remember one time a, a staff member came to me. And he said, well, I just don't get anything from Pastor Lett's sermons. Now listen, I, sit in the same, I sat in the same sermons he sat in. Many of you have sat on the ministry of Pastor Lett and immensely helped. You should have thought about that before you voted me in as pastor, but hey, it's too late now. Too late now. No return policy. He said, well, pastor, you know, he just, he talks about some soul winning and, and that. I remember thinking, you know what? You're too familiar with Jesus Christ. I remember thinking like, well, are you not in the same place I'm in? I'm touched by, I'm touched. You know, often we become so familiar with church and Jesus Christ that we begin to disregard the message. Oh, I've heard this before, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be about someone getting saved, and about having faith in Jesus and praying a little bit. I know what the Bible says, but, but. I know what God wants me to do. I know what the church thinks. And pastor, I know what you're going to tell me. We're so familiar, we disregard the message. We're so familiar, we have contempt in our heart. You see, disregard for Jesus restricts his help. His help, disregard for Jesus, hinders his message. And disregard for Jesus hurts me. You see, these people, they showed up on the outside, but they were far away on the inside. And we are in the same spot. We show up on the outside, but we're far away on the inside. We sit in our place, and we smile and nod, and we stand up at the right time, and sit down at the right time, and, and pretend to say the right things. We show up on the outside, but we are far away on the inside. These people showed up at the synagogue, and they listened and they acknowledged, but they refused. And it wasn't that Jesus Christ wouldn't do a mighty work. It's that he couldn't. He couldn't. Studying for this message, I was praying, and this morning I went for a walk this morning, and I like to do Sunday mornings and pray, and just my mind where it should be for, for the service and for the day and get ready for worship, and I wonder what Jesus Christ has wanted to do in my life when I have disregarded him. I wonder if, I, there are times, we, we, we've all been in church. There are times we've all been in church and Christ wanted to do something, but we allow something to stop it. We're too familiar. Well, I don't like the way that guy looks when he speaks. Sorry. Sorry. I don't like his delivery style. And sure, there's people we may connect with more or less. 
my friends, Jesus Christ wants to speak to us and to our hearts. Oh, yeah, I know what God's going to tell me. He's going to tell me to, to change this, but I don't want to. Yet we have disregard, and we hinder his mighty work. Sad, sad phrase. All he could do was lay a hand on a few sick folk, the Bible says. Now, listen here. If Jesus Christ healed a few sick people at First Baptist Church, we'd be rejoicing. Would we not? We'd line some people up, say, put your hand on this, on this man, on, on this woman. On this, on this, uh, this dear lady and, and this young child would take some healing. But it would be sad if Jesus Christ wanted to do something big and all he could do was something small. See, sometimes in our life, Jesus Christ, he wants to do something big. He wants to do a great work, a big work, a massive work. And we settle for the small things. We say, okay, Lord, you can... You can help me with this little situation. Give me a little advice right here. But I don't regard you and respect you enough to have the faith for you to do something really big in my life. Because that kind of faith is scary. That kind of faith, that unnerves us. That kind of faith calls us to something big, to see God do something great. And they had such disregard, they hindered the work of Jesus Christ. There's a hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And they said this, after watching the lives of Christians in our hospital, they said, you know what? Some of these Christians just don't live what they preach. They couldn't say that about Jesus Christ, but I imagine they can say it about us Christians. We're content to let Jesus just do a few little things, give us a little benefit, when he wants to do so much more We've seen him work. Is not this the carpenter? Is not this the one that, that has done these little things? You see, you've seen Jesus Christ work. You've seen him answer prayer. You've seen him touch your life. And yet we come to church, we come to the Bible, and we begin to disregard him. Church can be just a show. Our worship, just an action, rather than genuine respect. Churches who don't view Jesus correctly will begin to erode into social clubs. They'll have just a good time together and they'll move from vibrant communities of faith to just little clubs. And once you start disregarding Jesus Christ, you will lose your grip on faith altogether. I wonder what Jesus Christ wants to do in your life. I wonder what great work he wants to accomplish in your life, in your heart. I wonder what answer to prayer he's been waiting for you to, to seek. What event he wants to completely revolutionize in your life. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us what could have happened in Nazareth. The Bible doesn't tell us how many blind people stayed blind. The Bible doesn't tell us if anyone passed that maybe Jesus Christ could have raised from the dead. The Bible doesn't tell us if anyone was afflicted by demons. The Bible doesn't tell us that if there was hunger there that Jesus Christ could have met the need of hunger. The Bible doesn't tell us what could have been. It just tells us that all he could do was heal a few sick folk. And then he had to move on. My friends, he began at a place, a synagogue, where they claimed to want to know God. He went home to a place where they knew Jesus Christ. And I can't help but think, as we come to First Baptist Church, a place that we want to know Jesus Christ, do we not? We want to see him work. We want to see him answer prayer. We want to see him do something. I can't help but think if maybe sometimes we just disregard him. We come here. We worship. We compartmentalize him. And we don't respect him as the Savior and Creator and the Almighty One. As the one that can do anything. The one that can solve any problem in your life. Like the girl saying, he is more than enough. The one that can meet that need. The one that can solve life's problems. The one that can literally bring freedom when there's no freedom to be seen. The one who can save when no salvation seems possible. The one that can heal when no healing seems probable. Jesus Christ is the answer. 
But I'm afraid that we disregard him. We're too comfortable. I know what the church says. I know what the pastor says. But Jesus... Hmm. Our friends, I want to challenge us today. Look, please, last verse here. Verse number 6. Mark chapter 6, verse number 6. And he marveled. He was amazed. Because of their unbelief. Jesus Christ did have a reaction that day. His reaction was not a good reaction. I read this verse and I think as a parent, there are times that I have marveled in a bad sense. Have you parents? Your children do something and you're like, wow. I'm amazed. I didn't think that much failure was possible in life. Come on, parents, you're with me. You're like, wow, you, kids, you've truly shocked me today. I'm like, wow, you, you made a bigger mess. Even little things, right? We've been out fishing before, and you, your kids, I mean, as a, dad, as a dad who fishes with his family, what's my job? It's to, you know, sometimes put the worms on and, and untangle the knots. And you can get a fishing line back like, wow, I'm amazed. Like one cast, and you knotted this thing better. You don't just cut it and start over again. We've all had those moments. Fortunately, sometimes I've been amazed at myself. Wow, Howell, you made a bigger mess than you even thought possible. And Jesus Christ here marveled, but not in a good way. Not in the way that says, man, boy, that that moved me. That, That impressed me. There are times in Scripture Jesus did marvel at faith. There are times that he was like, wow, that's good faith. But right here he goes, I'm amazed. Not because of your faith, but because of your lack of faith. Because you should have known better. And I'm afraid sometimes, my friend, he shows up to us as Christians. Those who should know better. Those who have been partakers of Jesus Christ, who have seen him work, who have seen him answer prayers, who have seen him do things, who know about a mighty works. He doesn't walk away saying, wow. But, wow. I'm amazed. Not at your faith, but at your lack of faith. My friends, what's in your way? Don't let disregard for Jesus hinder his message and help in your life. Respect him, embrace him, and remember this. The greatest way to determine what you believe about Jesus is to consider your response of Jesus. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.